everybody, welcome. Today we're going to be talking about creating a safe environment for young children, child proofing and safety. So thanks for joining us. Child Care Answers is active on social media. Follow us for more workshop opportunities and parenting tips. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also visit us at childcareanswers.com backslash your child for several parenting tips and printables. And then you can view recordings of webinars on YouTube. So my name is Lauren. I am the Family Support Specialist with Child Care Answers and I'll be sharing information with you today. So today we're gonna to be talking about childproofing and safety and what that looks like for young children. Specifically, car seat recommendations and car seat safety, infant sleep, how to childproof your home. We're gonna discuss water and outdoor safety, as well as choking medications and poisons. So we'll go ahead and get started with car seats. So road injuries are the leading cause of preventable deaths and injuries to children in the United States and more than half of car seats are not used or installed correctly. So today we're gonna to talk about, are you using the correct seat and is it installed correctly? Correctly used car seats can reduce the risk of death by as much as 71%, which is why it's really important that our children are in, buckled safely and in the, pro in the appropriate seat. So we'll discuss buying the right seat and making sure that your child is in the correct seat how to install that seat correctly, and making sure that our child is in right and getting the right fit because every car and every seat is not right for every child, and when to change or adjust your seat. So we'll start with looking at what the recommendations are for the different types of car seats on the market. So on the market, you have rear-facing seats, which are infant or convertible seats. You have forward-facing or convertible seats. And then your child can transition to a booster with a harness and then a booster with a seat belt and then just a regular seat with a seat belt. So rear facing is recommended for children until they're at least two or until they reach the height and weight restrictions for that seat. Once they reach those restrictions, they may move to forward facing. So forward facing car seats are essentially made for children ages two to four plus or again, until they reach the height and weight restrictions for that seat. At that time, they'll transition to a booster, typically with a harness and then eventually with a seat belt. These are for children ages four to 12 or until a child reaches four nine. Once they reach four nine, they can transition to a seat belt in the back seat. Uh, children under 13 should always be in the back seat and never in the front seat. The American Academy of Pediatrics really recommends that children are rear facing until at least age two. And that's age two at the minimum. So we want children to be in the back seat rear facing until essentially they can't fit into their seat any longer. And children under age two who are rear facing are 75% less likely to die or be severely injured in a crash. So that's really important. I understand that some state laws have lesser restrictions or their laws are a little bit different than best practice. It's always best to follow best practice and not necessarily what the law states. The law is usually minimum health and safety standards. When you're installing your car seat, it's important to consult the experts. So whether that's reading the owner manual of both your vehicle and your car, or visiting a car seat clinic or a car seat expert for install. Each type of car seat is different and each type of car is different. There are some seats in SUVs or vans that do not allow a car seat to go in. So it's making sure that we're choosing the right seat and the right car seat for our children. It's also important when you're installing a car seat, whether it's the seat or the base, that it pass passes the inch test. This means that it moves in no more than one inch in either direction. Sometimes it can be pretty challenging to get a tight fit, but some tips are to sit on the car seater base while you're pulling the strap tight or to kneel on it while you're pulling it. That can help ensure that the car seat gets into the seat and you can pull it as tight as possible. If it wiggles more than one inch in either direction, you need to tighten it a little bit more. Also, you wanna make sure that you're using the seat belt or the latch, but not both. 
So we want to place either the seat belt through the car seat at the belt path or we want to use the tether system or the latch. Latch stands for lower anchors and tethers for children. They make installing a car seat a little bit easier, but we want to make sure that we're using one and not both. Also, we need to watch latch weights, weight limits. Lower anchor bars have a weight limit of 65 pounds, which includes the weight of the car seat plus the weight of your child. So once your child reaches that weight, we need to make sure that we're using the belt and no longer the latch system. The CDC has several guidance tools on their website regarding infant safety, child safety, as well as car seat safety. So their rear facing guidance is that the child's head is at least one inch below the top of the car seat. The harness strap should be at or below the child's shoulders. So when you're looking at where the strap comes from the seat, it should be at or below the child's shoulders for a rear facing child. The chest clip is buckled at armpit level and the harness straps are snug so you can't pinch any extra fabric in the shoulder. In addition, once your child moves to forward facing, you wanna begin using the hook and tighten the car seat's tether in behind the car seat. So there is a hook and tether behind the seat that reaches behind the car seat that you can see in this picture and attaches. You also wanna make sure that the straps are at or above the child's shoulders. So rear facing is at or below, forward facing is at or above. Again, the chest clip is buckled at the armpit level and the harness straps are still snug where you can't pinch them. During those winter months or when it's cold outside, we wanna make sure that children are in safely as well. So coats are not safe to be worn underneath the belt, belt buckle. So children should wear layers, the harness straps are buckled in tight and then we put the coat or blanket over the buckle and tight harness. So we don't want any of that bulky jacket or anything underneath the straps. That's true for infants all the way up. So that's it for car seat safety. So we're gonna transition now into infant sleep. So suffocation is the leading cause of infant death. And this is mainly due to an unsafe sleep environment. So we wanna make sure that we're placing baby to sleep following the ABCs. That means the child is alone, on their back and in a crib. Alone meaning not with another caregiver, child or animal, but also no blankets, pillows, bumper pads, stuffed animals and all that jazz. We also wanna make sure that we're laying infants on their back to sleep. Once they can easily roll over, they can adapt to their own sleep position but before they can roll over, it is essential that they are only sleeping on their backs. And then we wanna make sure that baby is in a crib to sleep. This could be a crib, a porta crib a pack and play or a bassinet, but it is their own separate sleep environment designed for infant sleep. This does not include an adult bed or a couch or a futon. Additionally, the use of blankets, bumper pads, stuffed animals, loose bedding, all that is not permitted for infants. Blankets can be transitioned once the child is over one, but I encourage that transition to be slow. There is no one-year-old that uses a blanket appropriately, and I find it best to transition closer to age two. Bumper pads are never helpful in the sleep environment. It's okay if their arms and legs go through the slats, the slats are small enough and safe enough for that. Additionally, as your child gets older, bumper pads can then be used as a step for them to climb out of their crib. After age one, you can introduce a stuffed animal or a lovey for them so that they have a comfort tool or a comfort item during sleep. Babies should never be placed to sleep with a bottle. We should be holding every baby for a bottle or nursing them until they fall asleep or until drowsy and then we can lay them down after. Additionally, room sharing is safer than bed sharing. The American Academy of Pediatrics really recommends that children, especially infants, share a room with their parents, but not a bed. That means baby is close to you, but not in the same sleep environment. Around six to 12 months, you can transition your baby to their own room and their own separate space. Pacifiers with nothing attached actually reduce the risk of SIDS. Pacifiers can be really helpful and helping infants learn how to self-soothe and great for toddlers as they're getting teeth and they're developing 
a little bit more self-regulation. They can control themselves a little bit more when they have a pacifier. Sleep sacks are a great option for warmth instead of a blanket. They are not necessary, so don't feel like you have to use a sleep sack, but they are a great option. A sleep sack, the sleep sack that is a swaddle should only be used until a child begins rolling over. So once your baby begins rolling over, it's time to transition from the swaddle into a regular sleep sack or nothing. You might think my baby is going to choke if they spit up when laying on their back. And that's actually not true. Science tells us that when a baby is sleeping on their back, their air tube is above their food tube. So that means their trachea is above their esophagus, which means as vomit comes up, it's going up into the mouth and either pushed out of the mouth or it's re-swallowed. And gravity is helping that liquid go right back into the esophagus um, and into the stomach. When you flip baby onto their side or stomach, those tubes get flipped. So not only is baby now spitting up with that chance of rebreathing it into the system, but also could possibly be laying in a pool of their own spit up or vomit. So it is safest for a baby to spit up when laying on their back than if they're laying on their side or stomach. So now we're going to transition to child proofing our home. So more than a third of child injuries and deaths happen at home. So it's important to make sure we have an environment that encourages our children to explore safely and freely with limited redirection or nose. This means that the majority of things that are accessible and within reach of children, they can explore with and it's safe for them. And that everything that is not safe for them is out of reach. The highest risk areas are water, heat or flames, toxic substances, and then potential for a fall. So kids are going to get hurt. They're gonna fall, crash, slip and tumble. And it's part of being a kid. And we wouldn't want it any other way. But there are little things we can do to ensure that kids avoid the more serious injuries that can lead to disabilities and even death. So the first step is to be prepared. So supervise at all time. So we always wanna know where our kids are and what they're doing. In addition to that, it's important to be current on CPR and first aid so that in the event of an injury or something happening, we know what to do. Also, keep those important numbers handy. So know the number to the non-emergency line for your police department, the number of the local hospital, and poison control. You wanna practice fire escape routes pretty often so that when the alarm goes off, your child knows what to do. And then utilize safety features on cabinets, doors, anything that comes with a safety feature, you wanna make sure it's enabled. So one of the biggest problems at home can be access to heat or flames. So the first rule is to create a kid-free kid -free zone. So teach younger children to stay at least three feet away from your cooking space. This includes the oven and the top of the stove. Also utilize those back burners of the stove and turn pot handles away from the edge. This will keep their little hands away from those hot areas. Also keep hot foods and drinks away from the edge of your counters and tables because we all know that they're trying to steal little snacks off the top of the table and when they reach for something they may knock something over. During bath time we want to make sure that bath water and the temperature is correct for our child. So before placing your child in the bath check the temperature on the inside of your wrist just like you did with the milk in the bottle when your baby when your child was a baby. The water should feel warm to the touch but not hot. And then watch children around fireplaces. So when a gas fireplace is turned on, the glass is extremely hot and can take more than an hour to cool down after it's turned off. So not a bad idea to cre create a three feet space around your fireplace as well. Also, we wanna prevent falls and strangulation. So utilize gates, gate locks, and knob covers. Especially at the top of the stairs, you want to have a mounted gate so that children cannot fall down the stairs. When you're utilizing equipment like high chairs, you want to make sure that the children are strapped in appropriately. Additionally, all furniture should be anchored and all TVs should be anchored to prevent them from falling over 
And we want to ensure that cordless window coverings are used so that children do not have access to the long cords attached to blinds. Guns are another tool at home that can be very hazardous and dangerous to children. So we wanna make sure that we keep guns out of reach and out of sight and store them unloaded and secured or locked with the ammunition separate from the gun. And we also wanna to talk to grandparents and parents of children's friends about guns in their home. And I know this conversation can be awkward and not necessarily fun. I've had this conversation with my in-laws and it's important, but it's a hard conversation to have. So talk to them about how they are locking up guns in their homes and what their children have access to. So children as young as three may be strong enough to pull the trigger of a handgun, which is why it's really, really important that they do not have access to these. And now we're gonna transition to water and outdoor safety, which is another component of the highest risk areas at home. So when we think about water safety, drowning isn't just about pools. Drowning is a leading cause of injury-related death in children, especially children under four, and then again in teenagers. So how kids drown varies by age. So children under one are most likely to drown in bathtubs, buckets, and toilets. And this is because babies are very top heavy. Their head is heavier than the rest of their body. So when they fall forward, they fall into something and then they can't get themselves out of it. One to four year olds, um, their most common form of drowning is in swimming pools, hot tubs, and spas. And this is because they just don't have the skills yet to swim on their own or have the stamina to swim well, even in floaties, if they're not being supervised. And then older kids, teens, and young adults are most commonly drowning in natural bodies of waters. And that's because they overestimate their swimming abilities. They think, I can swim really well in a pool, so I can swim in a lake and river too. And those bodies of water are just very different than a pool and require a little bit more um, supervision and safety protocols. So with water basics, we wanna make sure that we're following supervision. This means that when children are in water, that they are always within arm's reach of an adult. And also make sure that older children swim with a partner every single time. We also want to make sure that we're teaching children how to swim. So every child is different. So enroll children in swim lessons when they're ready. Consider their age development and how often they're around water when deciding if they're ready for swim lessons. Additionally, we want to teach children that swimming in open water is not the same as swimming in a pool. They need to be aware of uneven surfaces, river currents, ocean undertow, and changing weather and know what to do in an emergency. Learning CPR and basic water rescue skills may help you save your child's life. So when it comes to swim lessons, we wanna make sure that kids learn five essential water survival skills and that they're able to do these by themselves. So the things that we're looking for are that they can step or jump into water over their heads and return to the surface. They can float or tread water for one minute they can turn around in a full circle and find an exit. They can swim 25 yards to exit the water and they are able to actually exit the water. So if in a pool, they're able to exit without using a ladder. So this lets us know that our child can save themselves if for some reason they fall into water or they get themselves into an unsafe situation in a pool. Additionally, other safety concerns outside involve playing safely, using equipment appropriately, and then bugs and insects. So when it comes to playing safely, we wanna make sure that we're utilizing safety equipment like helmets. So yes, it's important to your, for your child to be wearing a helmet when they're riding a bike, even a toddler. Establish safe play areas with your children and let them know where they can play and where they can't play. An example of this is at my house, we have spray painted a line on our driveway. And my two-year-old and my seven-year-old know that they can only play on one side of the line and they're not able to cross that line. If I wasn't supervising for an extended period of time, I have no doubt that they would cross it, but they would hesitate before they did. So that is why supervision alongside of establishing safe play areas is important. We also wanna avoid harmful plants, 
and teach children about strangers and staying close. And also stay hydrated. When it comes to bugs and insects, we want to use bug sprays that contain DEET. So DEET has been proven to be safe for young children older than two months old. But we want to make sure that we're using it appropriately. DEET is going to repel mosquitoes, but also ticks, which is why it's super helpful. So choose a repellent with no more than 10 to 30% concentration of DEET. Use a lower concentration if kids will be outside only for an hour or two. If they're outside longer, use it with a higher concentration. But typically, a repellent with DEET should not be reapplied during the day. We also want to avoid using sunscreens that contain bug spray because sunscreen is reapplied, but bug spray does not. The reasons that DEET is better for young children than using a more natural bug spray or insect repellent is because the oil of lemon eucalyptus um, is a plant-based repellent that gives protection similar to DEET, but it is not safe for children under three. It is better to use a little bit of DEET and not get bit by a tick than to not use DEET at all. But before children go to bed or when they're done playing outside, we should wipe them down with a wipe or give them a bath. We also want to be prepared for allergic reactions because we never know if our child's allergic to a bug or an insect. And then when it comes to using safety equipment, use structures appropriately. That doesn't mean that it's not okay for children to climb up a slide, because it is. What's not appropriate or not okay is when they're climbing up the outside of a tube slide or on the back side of the playground. We wanna make sure that they're using it the right way. Also, take the temperature of equipment. So feel the slide before they go down. Also, we don't want to allow children to explore outside of their physical means. This means it's probably not beneficial to lift your child up to equipment or help them utilize a play structure. If their body can't do it by themselves, they shouldn't be exploring in that way. So when we do this, we allow children to explore within their physical means. That way they build trust in their body. They know what they can and cannot do. And when they have trust in their body, falls and accidents are less likely to happen. When we're lifting children up to play equipment or helping them navigate play structures, that's when accidents happen because children think that they can do things that their body is just not ready for yet. While we're outside, we also wanna protect ourselves from the sun. So use sunscreen. So a mineral-based sunscreen is safer than a chemical sunscreen. Chemical sunscreens contain harmful chemicals. While approved by the FDA, these chemicals enter the bloodstream and are absorbed into the body at very, 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 very high rates. And they may act as a carcinogen, which means that they may cause cancer or may disrupt hormone production in young children. So mineral sunscreens are always safer than a chemical sunscreen. And remember to reapply. That little bit of sunscreen isn't good all day. So reapply every hour to an hour and a half or whatever the bot bottle tells you. And then make sure you're checking expiration dates because sunscreen does expire and it's not as effective. For children under six months, we recommend that they are in shade or they're wearing clothing that protects them from the sun instead of using a sunscreen. But if they're going to be at the beach, it's safer to use a little bit of sunscreen than for them to get burned. Also things like swim covers or swim shirts, hats and sunglasses do offer protection. And then temperature matters. So we want to avoid playing outside during the sun's peak, which is 11 to 2. And be aware of heat index and wind chills. So just because it says that it's 90 degrees doesn't mean it feels like 90 degrees. It may feel like 102 which may not be a safe temperature to explore outside. But go outside every day, even when weather isn't ideal. In the winter, even if it's cold out, go outside for a couple of minutes and play outside. Exercise is important. When it's hot out, go early in the morning or in the evening when sun at, isn't at its peak temperature. And lastly, we're going to talk about choking, medications, and poisons. So we wanna write down this number, it's really important. It's the National Poison Control Center number. Um, so have that in your phone ready and handy um, to call if your child ingests something that 
you don't know is safe or not. If for some reason your child is um, collapsed or they're not breathing, you wanna call 911, don't call the poison control number. So the poison control number is 1-800-222-1222, which is a pretty easy number to remember. So one of the concerns at home is choking. So there are food and non-food hazards when it comes to choking. So we wanna make sure when it comes to food that we're cutting our pieces no larger than one half inch. This will make sure that when your child swallows their food whole, it won't get stuck in their throat. Foods that can cause common choking hazards are there for children until they're about four. So we wanna make sure that we ensure that our children are getting foods that aren't going to stamp. Let's redo that one. Okay, let's start the slide over. One of the concerns at home is choking hazards. We want to make sure that when they're eating, our children's food is cut in no larger than one half inch pieces. This will make sure that children under four are able to swallow their food whole and it won't get stuck in their throat. Some common things that are choking hazards for young children when it comes to food are hot dogs, nuts and seeds, chunks of meat or cheese, whole grapes, hard, gooey, or sticky candy, popcorn, chunks of peanut butter, raw vegetables, raisins, chewing gum, and marshmallows. Not to say that you can't feed your child these things. You just need to make sure that they're cut in a way that they're not going to choke. Additionally, there are non-food choking hazards as well. The biggest concern at home are coin and button batteries. So one child every three hours is treated in an ER for swallowing a button battery. So we wanna make sure that we keep these coin-sized lithium batteries out of reach of children. And if you suspect your child ingested a battery, go to the hospital immediately. Don't induce vomiting or have your child eat or drink anything until assessed by a medical professional. National Battery Ingestion Hotline is 1-800-498-8666. We know that when infants and young children are crawling around and walking, they're putting everything in their mouth. So some things that are also a concern in addition to coin and button batteries are latex balloons, coins, marbles, toys with small parts, toys that can be compressed to fit entirely into your child's mouth, pen or marker caps, small balls, again, button batteries, medical syringes, and hair barrettes and beads. So as children are exploring, we wanna make sure that we're removing these items and getting them out of reach. For toys that say children over three, the main concern with that is the access to those batteries. So we wanna follow those safety precautions so that our children, again, aren't playing with things that could be unsafe for them. In addition, here are some poison prevention tips when it comes to medications, and cleaners. So follow directions on the label when you give or take medications and always turn on the light when you give or take medications at night so that you know you have the correct amount of the right medicine. I know it's not fun in the middle of the night when you're giving your child another round of Tylenol during a fever, but turn that light on just to make sure that you're at the right dose. And keep medicines in their original bottles or containers so you always know what it is and be smart about storage. So store all medicines and household products up and away, out of sight in a cabinet where a child cannot reach them. A lot of medications for young children taste yummy. So we wanna make sure that they're out of reach so that they don't access them and try to take them more than they need them. Secure the child's safety cap completely every time you use a medication. And I'll admit, I'm bad at this. My husband gets very angry at me because I'm not good at securing lids properly. Turn all household chemical nozzles to off when not in use, so if your child does get it and they try to squirt it, nothing happens. When you are cleaning, turn on the fan, open the windows so that you have great ventilation. Keep chemical products in their original bottles and never mix household products together because you're not sure what's going to happen when those two chemicals mix. And then utilize carbon monoxide detectors and check batteries often because carbon monoxide, we can't see and we can't smell. So we wanna make sure that safety protocols like a filter or a detection monitor 
let us know if they're sensing carbon monoxide in our home. Additionally, do not call medicine candy. We want them to know that it is not something that is fun to take or something they should be taking when they are not sick. Identify poisonous plants, including berries, flowers, leaves, and mushrooms around your house and yard and place them out of reach or remove them. Talk to your children about them. You see those berries on the tree? Don't eat them. You see those mushrooms in the yard? Don't eat them. They can be poisonous. So now that we've talked about child proofing and child safety, I want to thank you for joining us. Child Care Answers is in Central Indy. We service Marion, Hendricks, and Hamilton counties, but there is a child care resource and referral agency in your county. So you can use this map to find your local child care resource and referral agency. At Child Care Answers, we're here to help. So myself is the family support specialist. I'm here to provide parenting resources and support. I can provide one-on-one -on -one consultations to discuss your child's development. And I can also provide parenting workshops and support. Kristen Cofield is our family engagement specialist who can connect you to community resources, help you locate childcare, and support your child or your mental health. And Benito does all of that, but in Spanish. So please complete our family information form located at bit.ly backslash CCA family or text care to 1-833-222-1221. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you next time.